Started here, folks. So we got Shiver, Freeman Sullivan out here at 850 Bryant, San Francisco Hall of Injustice. San Francisco Public Defender's Office that are in full attendance here to uh, show the Black Lives Matter. And some others too, ABA members. Oh, good. Bar Association. They're doing it in four counties all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to see this now. That's the kids song. We shall overcome. If you love that song, sing it. Because we need to overcome. I'm tired. We're tired. Black lives really do matter. We will overcome this. We will defeat it. And we will win it. Justice for all.
those of you just joining us, we're down here at 850 Bryant Street, where we have San Francisco Police Public Defender's Office out here rallying for Black Lives Matter.
No justice! No peace! No racism! All right, I think we gotta do this a little louder now! We gotta make sure... You gotta make sure that people inside the building can hear what we're saying. Because that's who the judges, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, and the people who are behind bars got to be able to hear us. So we got to we got to do a little louder now. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. Police. No justice. No peace. No racist. Police. No justice. No peace. No racist. Police. No justice. No peace. Well, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Adachi. I serve as a public defender in the city and county of San Francisco. Thank you, Jeff. And we are here today yeah, hello, Justice. standing in solidarity with the protesters in Ferguson, Missouri, with the protesters in Cleveland, Ohio, yeah. with the protesters in New York City, yeah. with the protesters right here in the Bay Area. Yeah over the nation to say that the unjustified and unnecessary killing of brown and black men and boys must stop. We are here. We are here standing in solidarity with the families of Michael Brown, with Eric Gardner, with Tamir Rice, yes. with Alex Nato, yes. and the countless other victims of police Oscar shooting. Grant. We're going to hear. We're going to hear from the uncle of Oscar Grant, who's here today. Amen. But this is about more than just that. It is about calling for the reform of the criminal justice system because without that. This is going to continue to happen again and again and again. It's called New Age Lynching. We are at a point in this country, we have been for a long time, where there is a tipping point. Where hopefully people are finally starting to acknowledge the reality of what's happening in this country. As public defenders, this is something that we know. Our job as public defenders is to ensure that there is justice for all. That's what it says right there on the building. That's the promise. But we know that that doesn't happen. We know that routinely poor people are prosecuted more severely. People of color are arrested and convicted at a higher rates disproportionately than anyone else in this country. And we know that there are judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys who are turning a blind eye to this. They have turned a blind eye to this for many, many years. And we're here today to say that we take responsibility for that. No that we make sure that this does not happen again. I'm very proud to stand in solidarity with public defenders in Alameda County who are protesting today. Public defenders in Solano County who are protesting today. Public defenders in Santa Clara County that are protesting today. I'm very proud to have the Marin County Public Defender, Jose Varela, who's here with us today. And public defenders in Contra Costa County that are protesting today. I'm very proud now to introduce Chris Height, who is the Deputy Public Defender with our office. Mr. Height has been a public defender for 16 years, so he knows what it's like to fight for justice. In 2013, Rebecca, Rebecca Young, who you hear chatting back there, and Chris Height 
agreed to chair our office's racial justice committee. So we began looking at the disproportionate arrest and conviction and incarceration of people of color. We began looking at specific issues relating to bail reform, incarceration reform, recidivism, diversion programs, and implementing aggressive litigation strategies to ensure that the promise of fairness is met. We have a long, long way to go, but this is an issue that we've been looking at for some time. So let's give it up for Chris Hyde. Thank you, Jeff. As a public defender, when you go into the building behind me at the Hall of Justice, as a public defender, you walk into a holding tank and you see individuals that you look into their eyes and you see individuals when you walk into the, the interview rooms, when you interview the client that you've been assigned and you look across the table to get your interview to determine what I'm going to do to protect this person's rights, what I'm going to do to put forth a defense. And when I look into that person's eyes, I see a black individual, I see a brown individual, because they are the ones that by the justice system end up there the most. They are the ones that we need to give a word to, to give a voice to. They're the ones why we say black lives, black, brown, black and brown lives matter. That's right. That's right. They matter because when we look into they are, their eyes, they are the ones that are facing the injustices that occur on the street. They are the ones that face the, brutal, the brutality that we see every day as public defenders, that we hear the stories from our clients personally when we sit down in the holding tanks and we talk to them. They're the stories that we hear when we have our interviews that don't make it into the news, that don't make it into the press. The stories about how they've been pulled out of vehicles, how they've been taken off the sidewalks, how they've been disrupted in, by their community, their, in their communities, that they can't walk down the street and not be harassed by officers and think that they are somehow reasonably uh, committing some crime. False reports. That they then can be searched without any uh, search clauses. That they are stopped without any reasonable suspicion to believe that they have done anything wrong, wrong other than be black or brown. This is why we fight for black lives because public defenders are the only ones that can stand by them and put forth what they see and need as justice. In our justice committee that we just started, the, the, the Racial Justice Committee, we're now focused on putting together a 12-point plan to address police brutality and address the police situations and misconducts that occur yeah. on, the, on a daily basis that we see we have the draft for this we're going to distribute it to the other public defenders offices in the state. We're going to get people on board so the city and counties of the state of California can adopt these measures either through the police practices of each individual police department or through state and county legislation so that we can make a difference and change the way this works. Because this is not working like this. People have to realize that black and brown lives matter. And if we don't do it as public defenders, we have to do it as public defenders and we have to push it in the state and county legislatures to get past the difficulties of how that comes about. Because it's not going to be easy, it's going to be a fight, but we're willing to do it and we're starting it now, we're starting it here and we're starting it today. Power and to the people! We are combined in our effort, as, you, as Jeff just said, with the, the public defenders offices across the state. And all I want to do is, right behind us, we have the people that are, at times, that can, you can hear them right up in the jails right now, and I think they already hear us. And what I want our people behind right now is get a loud, Black Lives Matter. Because Black Lives Matter! 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 Thank you. I'm black and I'm proud. On January 1st, 2009, it's about six years ago, 
a young man who was just 22 years old named Oscar Grant III, a father, a member of our community, was gunned down by a BART police officer named Johannes Meserly at the BART station at Fruitvale. Although he was charged with murder by directly filing uh, a file by the district attorney, he was only convicted of involuntary manslaughter by a Los Angeles jury. His case galvanized people in the Bay Area from all over this country, from all over this country, who came together under the banner of reform. They have led the struggle here and the cases that I mentioned earlier and many others and I'm sure others that are yet to come are joining this movement. But here today, we have Cephas Johnson, who's the uncle of Oscar Grant, who has been involved in the struggle since his nephew was killed. He's also known as Uncle Bobby. Uncle Bobby came all the way from Phoenix. Although he lives here, he was in Phoenix working with the family of a young boy who had been killed by a police officer there. And he was there yesterday and he came all the way back to be with us today. So let's give it up for Uncle Bobby. Uh, first, let me say thank you, Jeff, <clears throat> for um, sending out that call to me. Uh, let me just tell you uh, quickly first, for those that may not know, I am Oscar Grant's uncle, affectionate known to the community as Uncle Bobby. Uncle Bobby! Oscar mother, Wanda is my baby sister. And of course, Oscar and I had a very close relationship, so I was um, dearly hurt with what happened to him in that murder by Johannes Mesley, but also extremely hurt to see it continuously go on. You know, and I want to say I am really, really emotionally touched to see today our public defenders, our attorneys that have represented us in this system uh, to hopefully get some form of real justice that we so truly deserve. So I want to say thank you to all of you that are here today first. No, really, thank you. Thank you. This is huge to know that public defenders all around this county right now is speaking and standing to this very issue. See, we're very clear that had it not been for you, the community, that stood with us as a family, that cried with us, that went back and forth to court with us, that utilized your First Amendment right to speak to that very injustice, and most importantly, pulling out your cameras because what you saw and you felt was wrong, and providing it to the family and allowing it to go viral, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So I want to say thank you to the community. That's right, power to the people. And because of that, for the first time in California state history, we got to feel this and understand the significance of this. For the first time in California state history, an officer was charged, arrested, convicted, and sent to jail because of the community here in the Bay Area. So thank you. Woo. You know, and I better add this so that we be clear. For the first time in killing a black or brown youth while on duty. So as you can see all across this country, what we're seeing today is a system failing us when it comes to young black men and brown men being killed by the police. It's modern lynching. That's right, sister. It's modern lynching. But simple reforms is not going to just be the answer. Because we got to understand the system is broken at the grand jury level. And if by chance we can get an indictment charged from the grand jury, we still got to deal with the district attorney. But let's say if by chance we can get past the district attorney, right? then we still got to deal with the jury. And if by chance we could get past the jury, we got to deal with the judge, and then of course the appeal court judge. 
And I'm saying that because at every level, it is broken. It is broken. So simple adding cameras to the police uniform does not mean that the solution has been given and that we should be able to just clap our hands and say all is solved. Because as we can see, in Oscar case, in Rodney King's case, in Eric Gardner case, and I could go on with the video cameras that have been involved, That's what you matter. see happen to be what the district attorney will say is what you're not seeing. And many times the jury have a tendency, because of the biases that has been perpetrated on black and brown men, they have a tendency to see in that video what the district attorney says that you see. You know, Eric Gardner was choked to death. Now we're being told he wasn't choked, but basically he was really killed because of some medical condition, uh, his own health issues. You know, Oscar Grant was resisting arrest, and as you can see in the video, he was actually held down. Uh, where he said himself, listen to this, while he was on that ground, he said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. While before he was thrown to the ground, he had his hands up, he said, please don't tase me, please don't tase me, I have a daughter. Michael Brown, hands up. Eric Gardner, I can't breathe, Oscar, I can't breathe. Trayvon Martin, Oscar was on the phone talking to his fiance when Trayvon Martin was on the phone talking to his loved one. All these shootings that we see on a consistent basis throughout this country happen to be mostly derived from a phone call from someone that has the tendency to perceive that this black individual, brown individual, is doing something wrong. Tamir Rice, John Crawford. Now, Romaine Brisbane in Phoenix, Arizona, um, is the most recent. And many of you might not know about this case, but he, right, he had pill bottles in his pocket. The officer thought he had a gun. He felt the pill bottles end up killing this poor young man in front of his children in the doorway. There's a mass movement, as you can see, all across this country and in regards to the shooting. And right now, people are going to Phoenix to assist the community there in speaking to this very issue. So by you being here and expressing your outrage and your disappointment in a system that has purposely and continuously denied the right for us to have true justice is tremendous. So you know what? You need to applaud yourselves for just taking the stand. I want to say again, thank you. But I am truly proud to be here. I was in Phoenix with the family. The funeral is going on right now. My wife is still there. And they're right now burying this young man. You know, and uh, she called me this morning um, sharing the sadness the fam family is going through. So I'll be able to take them some good news, letting them know that there's a community here in San Francisco, here in the Bay Area, that is standing with that family, of course, crying with that family, but again, utilizing your right to speak to this very injustice that we see on a regular basis. You know, and I need to say this, the very foundation of this system our society rests on this criminal justice system. Any time a people that don't feel like they're getting justice within this system, there's an imbalance that takes place within our own system, the individual. And because of that imbalance, there's all types of mishaps, or not even just mishaps, but actions that can be taken in regards to get that, that justice that we so truly deserve. So it is, it is incumbent upon us to understand that we are at a state of emergency. Yes, right. This system, yes. the very existence that we know today is at a state of emergency. Yes. It is no longer about us, but it is about your babies, your grandbabies, and those that are coming behind them. If we fail in our responsibility to change this system as Jeff has taken the lead in bringing you out here to do then we fell in our responsibility to bring our children a better condition in this life, a better society. So let us continue to be vocal. Let us continue to increase the swell that's happening all across this nation. And then let us, let us continue to speak to this injustice that we see on a regular basis. Because I'm telling you, Tatiana would say thank you. Tatiana's Oscar daughter. She has no business fearing the police. She will say, 
when she see the police duck to her little cousin. Duck. This is what children are saying today. What happened to Michael Brown in them streets and them young children seeing it has been traumatized. These babies, these children are fearing the police to such a degree that there's nothing good that can come out of that except devastation to this total country. So we have a sincere commitment to make this world and the society a better place for them. That means the total destruction of this system in the way that we know it and to rebuild it in a way that would be fair and just to all. So let me say, and we got to echo this so these young men here that are locked up can hear this, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter! 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 Thank you. Our final speaker uh, is, is somebody uh, who I have tremendous respect for. One of the reasons we wanted to do this rally is as public defenders to reach out to other attorneys. San Francisco has a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers. And we need to reach out to the legal community, no matter what you do, because you are all uphold to support the Constitution and the law. That's an oath that you take as an attorney. And so to turn your back on what is happening or not get involved in what's happening is wrong. I was so inspired the other day by seeing over a thousand young people over at Mission High School to hear Michael Brown Sr. speak. And they were engaged, active, and they wanted to see change. And that's really what this change is about. And so I know this next speaker, Yolanda J Jackson, who is the newly minted and appointed director of the Bar Association of San Francisco. It's one of the largest bar, bar associations and the most progressive in the country. And uh, she is here uh, to offer her words of support. Yolanda? I love my city's public defenders. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here today to support an issue that at its very core seems basic, and that is ensuring justice and equality, but in reality, it is a very complicated undertaking, and we realize that. I want to thank the San Francisco Public Defender's Racial Justice Committee for its work on these very tough issues and for getting us all focused and started on solving these problems. So simply because the issues and the solutions may be complicated and they involve matters that are related to human behavior, systemic dysfunction, and race relations does not mean that we should not all be ready to roll up our sleeves and to begin to diagnose and prescribe. As Charles Hamilton Houston so eloquently stated many, many years ago, and it is no less relevant then, today than it was then, a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite. <laughs> and I am here today to put out a call to action to all lawyers in the Bay Area, including myself, to not be parasites, but for us to be part of the change that this society is so desperately needs. In San Francisco, Blacks make up approximately 6% of the population, but over 53% of custody and jails. That's crazy. Huh. Police involved shootings involve, involving white officers versus black officers has, have very starkly different statistics when you look at them. The shootings and the disparity among citizens of color and other citizens are a function of training, how and where policing takes place in our cities, the fact that there is fear, lack of trust, and lack of respect on both sides of the equation, and that racial profiling may or may not work and may not have the value that many of our police systems think that they have. Finger pointing will not help, however, and I hope you all walk away with me today knowing that. We cannot afford to simply point fingers. It's not one agency, it's not one department, and it's not one component of our population that is creating this problem. We are all responsible, and we are all accountable at this point. Yeah. 
San Francisco lawyers are known for their brilliant legal minds, starting with our public defender standing behind me. We are lawyers with a heart in this city, and I'm very proud of that. We are often national leaders on very tough issues, and this time should be no different. Lawyers work within the justice system every day. We understand how the justice system works, and in many ways, we have helped to shape our justice system through our work. The Bar Association of San Francisco and its over 7,500 members believe in and have historically acted within our mission, which reads in part that we will champion equal justice to promote humanity and excellence. The issue of officer killings of young black men in desperate rates, in, excuse me, disparate rates, is at the core of championing, champion, champion, championing justice and humanity. San Francisco has a unique opportunity to be part of the solution. We have the opportunity to show leadership to the nation and to show how we can be thoughtful, strategic, and effective in coming up with solutions to these very critical and sensitive problems. Now, we have seen and we have had sit-ins and die-ins and lie-ins and protests and town hall meetings and rallies. It's time to get to work, lawyers. Let's come together, utilize our legal training, roll up our sleeves, and put our analytical and problem-solving skills at, to work. When young boys continue to die at the hands of those who are charged with serving and protecting, we have a crisis on our hands. So where do we begin? We begin by coming together as a task force. We look at and we analyze the facts and the statistics from wing to wing of our justice system, from policing to sentencing. We measure outcomes of efforts that have been made and will continue to be made, and then we publicize and applaud and replicate the successful outcomes across the country. We as lawyers can engineer the social change that we need to stop this. We can turn the rhetoric and the outcry into meaningful change and continued effort toward equal justice and humanity. So I ask you, who will stand with us on this? We're going to end today's rally with a commitment to work on reform. Working on reform doesn't mean simply coming out with a list. Anybody can come out with a list, and there are many lists out there, many suggestions out there. But as Uncle Bobby warned, it's not just a matter of one thing or another. It's going to take a change in culture. It's going to take accountability. And most importantly, it's going to take the will of the people to make sure, to make sure that these reforms are implemented. What we commit to is working with others. I, in San Francisco, perhaps it's a rarity, but I actually have a good relationship with the police chief, with the district attorney, with the probation department. Now, that's a starting point. It doesn't say that the system here is any less corrupt or racist than anywhere else. Don't, don't let you know, the San Francisco's progressive uh, reputation uh, make you think otherwise. As Yolanda said, we have 56% of the people in jail are African Americans, even though they're only less than 6% of the population here. We see routinely higher bails set for black and brown clients than their white counterparts. We see prosecutors pushing cases harder, charging more charges, uh, offering tougher plea bargains, and recommending higher sentences. We see judges who often turn a blind eye when police officers are caught lying or are untruthful. We see police officers who, when they have to grant a motion to suppress because there was an illegal stop or detention, simply look to the police officer and apologize that they have to grant the motion on the rare occasions that they do. We see judges penalize people who decide to exercise their right to a trial, mostly poor people of color. Even within public defender's office, we are not, uh, you know, prevented from unconscious bias and bias within ourselves. A, a, a terrible defense attorney who does a lousy job representing his or her client can do more harm than anybody. And that's something we have to remember and own up to. And we have to look at all of us. And we have to look at reform in a comprehensive way. 
And so we look forward to working with the community, working with everyone to make things better because that is the obligation that we owe the next generation. So thank you for being here. We are going to close. We started with a chant. We're going to close with silence. And it's a pledge not to be silent going forward. We're, we're going to be silent, take a moment of silence for four and a half minutes. I know it's not going to translate on television. You don't want to see four minutes of silence. But we're going to do this just for ourselves and the people here. Why? It represents the four and a half hours that Michael Brown laid on the street, unattended. Four and a half hours. So we're going to take four and a half minutes and acknowledge that. I want to thank everyone who's here. I want to thank all of the private defense attorneys uh, who are here supporting this. The academicians. I know Ron Tyler's here from Stanford. We look forward to working with you and many others. And yeah, all of us are none, right? And uh, Stephanie, I see here. Yeah. We're here too. Please yeah, try not to right. my oh, Sorry, right. sorry. And remember that going forward, if we're going to change the criminal justice system, we've got to work with everyone, all of us or none, to make this happen. Thank you.
you notice why the time that we just spent by 75. That's another time the rocket drops a lot of battery space. It. That was uh, Jeff Adachi, Uncle Bobby, uh, uncle of uh, Oscar Grant, and all the public defenders out here in San Francisco. Uh, a little background, uh, San Francisco Public Defender's Office was the first public defender's office in the nation. Um, it was founded in 1920s, I think 1922. Um, and before 1922, if you were arrested, you didn't have uh, an appointed attorney if you didn't have the money to pay for one. So, uh, and like I say, uh, I've worked with San Francisco Public Defender's Office on a number of cases, and they've always done a really great job. That's all I can tell you. And, uh, I'm here personally for court support for some of the people that were arrested uh, because of Saturday's protest. So I'm going to stick around. I won't be live streaming the court case, of course, but uh, I'm here, and I hate this place, the Hall of Justice, or Injustice, I should say. And uh, that's that. Anyway. I have to go and talk to somebody here, and uh, I love all you guys for watching. Thanks for watching again. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Freeman Sullivan. Uh, much love.